honor for me to invite this man. It was actually I was the one who invited him to be here, and he spent time ten hours flying here, and he's flying back in two hours now. Uh, you have many many lines here, so many that well, my friend, we should do that. <laughs> Machines are pretty lousy in uh, composing music and writing poems, but they're actually pretty good in two things. And one thing is to do very boring jobs, things we as humans just don't like doing, very repetitive. A meter reading is a very good example. So you don't want to go every month as a person and read the water meter, electricity meter. You just don't want to do that. Now machines can do that. They can automate that. Very repetitive, boring jobs. Another thing is where they can excel is in time critical decision taking. We are in times where suddenly the information influx is just taken up so much where machines, get in, uh, where machines produce a lot of uh, information. You're getting bits and bytes decision taking, a factory for instance, a, 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 a machine rotating, suddenly something has happened, you have to take a very critical decision in a very short time. Um, machines are very good in taking these decisions very quickly too. And this is where really these machine, machine communications are very useful for. Now, before I go on, I wanted to show you, actually, you know, despite we have a lot of M2M, a lot of machines in the title, it's in the end for humans we use all that. So there, there's a website here which I like very much, it's postcapes.com, Internet of Things Examples, and they <laughs> all use end-to-end -end technology. And I'm just taking, I've taken a few samples here and I'm going to show you a few samples down the road. So one is, for instance, heat efficiency. You can use sensors all over the house, um, just measuring the temperature, regulating essentially your, your house. So there's a company called Nest, which is pro pro uh, providing these uh, smart thermostates. Uh, smart outlets. You could actually control the plugs, the electricity plugs from your iPhone. You could say I'm switching this on and off. This is all happening with the machines in here and the machine on your mobile phone. Crack, uh, 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 track down lost items. Light your home. So Philips is uh, selling something really interesting today. They're selling these smart light bulbs. So you can buy a bulb today which uh, has a Wi-Fi in there. So you screw it into your home and it connects to your Wi-Fi station and you can actually control the light temperature and whatever you need to control in real time in your home. So these things are really taken off. If you have a small garden, you can use these garden sensors, etc., etc. So a lot of stuff there, but in the end, we're using these small, ubiquitous, invisible sensors and actuators, these machines, to make our life easier. It's all about big data as well. So we're collecting a lot of information here. So there's a lot of uh, bits and bytes flowing to big databases and companies start to collect that information and try to make sense out of that in one way or another. It's also about opportunities. I very much love this slide. This has been produced by General Electric a while ago. They call the whole landscape of Internet of Things the industrial internet for good reason because they think these type of machine to machine type of technology will really take off in industrial settings. And you can see, we're talking about really heavy verticals here. We're not talking about something very light here. So it's oil and gas, healthcare, transportation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If we start using machines, small machine sensors, actuators, we optimize uh, all the processes which are part of these verticals, these are the financial gains we get. So it's, it's a lot of money here. We're talking about uh, billions and billions of dollars. So there's an opportunity here to, to really make this happen. <coughs> Technically speaking, it's a bit like the, the, uh, the oil business. So there's an upstream, there's a processing, there's a downstream. On the upstream side, you have sensors or actuators in the field. They communicate wirelessly or wired with each other and or directly to a gateway. From a gateway, it goes to the internet. You store the data, you profile it, you put analytics on top. You try to take a suitable and a very intelligent decision. Now on the downside, once you've taken the decision, this actually goes down to the decision-taking engine, so you interact again with other machines, you interact with uh, users, with smartphones, etc., etc. 
The really interesting thing is happening here on the, on the actual um, data processing. So what you see today is these big data analytics crystallizing, big companies having them, Cisco, IBM, um, et cetera, et cetera. They are fed by three different streams. So you have a machine to machine stream and this is really what I'll be talking about today. So this is real time certified sensor data flowing into the big data analytics. You have crowdsourced stuff, so this is just human to machine type of data. This is data gathered from your mobile phones, uh, from any stuff you're actually carrying around. And then you have just information to, to machine. So you have uh, something which is just laying, lying around in the internet. You don't know how reliable it is. You don't know how good the information is, but it is there. The weather forecast, um, you know, a very personalized opinion on, on, on the football match, uh, Twitter feeds, Facebook feeds, it's all there. So what's happening today is I can tell you that from a first-hand account from my own company. So my own company provides machine-to-machine -machine data. And we work with IBM. IBM has a very big data analytics. And uh, what they're doing is they're trying to optimize cities. And the data we provide is transportation data. So we are able to say, you know, where, where there's a traffic jam, where there is a parking place which you can actually use because it's free or which area should you avoid because there's no parking available. So we have sensors which are certified, robust, out in the field, providing all this information to IBM's uh, big data uh, analytic platforms. They're also using data from, uh, you know, the, from Google, so the traffic patterns, and they're using Twitter feeds, Facebook feeds, uh, weather information, etc. So they're able to say Barcelona, when I was still in Barcelona, you know, uh, Real Madrid is playing Barcelona and Barcelona. It's going to rain. Uh, there's a lot of people coming down to, 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 to downtown trying to see the game. And uh, what happened in the past is based on these analytics is, okay, if it rains, big game, that road is blocked, there's no park in there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they're start suddenly able to re-engineer the city. They're able to say, hey, guys, uh, don't come down in the city in this part of the city go this to this part of the city because traditionally when when the, when this happens it's it, the city is just over full so therefore you know using data from the past building statistics uh, comparing it to real-time trends allows you to essentially offer completely new things improve efficiency in the city as an example offer new new services power completely new applications and they may just offer uh, a completely open API here so you can use the data streams and build your own applications based on on the data generated so that's a little bit of a trend but we're going to continue only on the machine to machine stuff now what I showed you this vision here um, is uh, is very nice and neat but to make it technically happen is very challenging because we are talking about rolling out billions and billions of sensors now people always get very excited about some people talk about seven trillion sensors um, other people talk, Cisco talks about 50 billion sensors. 50 billion sensors is not so much, actually, if you think about it. Okay, we have between 7 and 10 billion phones uh, connected shortly. So it's just about five times more, which means if a base station is uh, servicing maybe 50 people, it's going to be 250 sensors. Okay, so it's not too much. People talk about mega scalability issues. It's not such a big deal. But still, it's a challenge. It's a challenge because even 10 times more nodes per base station um, is a problem. Uh, it needs to run autonomously. I'll show you this later. self There's a lot of new things which actually come into the whole design which need to be considered when rolling out these type of systems. So I'll show you a little bit some trends on what is happening in the M2M space and then we dwell on some applications in the smart city space. So when you look at what actually M2M stands for, there's no magic. It stands to, uh, for machine to machine. So there's one machine on one end, a sensor and actuator. There's a machine on another end, and there's a two part. So a networking part, which actually networks them both together. And this is really where we have our expertise. Now coming to the networking part, there's no magic either. We know what it is composed of. So there's an access network, which gets the information from, it, for example, your smart meter, to your gateway, it goes through maybe a, a backhaul network, then a core network, and then the internet to reach the actual end client. So there are loads of constituents which we are really familiar with. We have been designing them for the past 20, 20, 25, 30 years. 
Before going on on the challenges, I want to show you some examples of how machines can be connected because there's not a single way of doing it. So uh, when I worked in France Telecom, we worked a lot on the smart metering. So this was in 2005, so it's almost 10 years ago now. And we were exposed to three different companies which offered smart metering in three different ways. So one company just cabled them. No problem, you can do that. Okay, you just take a meter, you, you connect it to whatever is the closest, could be a proprietor, could be Ethernet, whatever you want to do. It just works. Um, another company said, okay, let's do short range multi-hop. Um, in fact, it's, it has to be multi-hop because it's short range. It's not because the other way around. So short range has to be multi-hop until it gets wirelessly to, a, to an internet connection. Could be a DSL box, whatever you want to do. And then there was another company which is of, which were, as of 2005 actually, they started 2002, was completely revolutionary. And they said, hey, let's use multi-hop, you know, low power uh, mesh networking until we get to our gateway. And the gateway is SIM enabled, so it's again wireless. So there's a, there was a 2.5G actually, a 2G modem <laughs> firing out the data in real time. At that time, that was completely new. But the future is that one here. We want to get rid of all that. What we want to do is we want to actually insert a SIM card in every single meter, okay, in every single sensor. In the 50 billion devices we want to roll out on this planet, we want them to be SIM enabled. Now, it doesn't mean we actually have to open it and put uh, a SIM in there, so we don't have to necessarily produce 50 billion SIMs. There's a trend of the soft SIM coming, so you can actually do that remotely and just reprogram them also if you want to change operator. But that's a trend, so we are slowly shifting away from the cable version to the purely kind of cellular uh, type of uh, M2M solution. Now, each of these has a pro and a con, so there are advantages and disadvantages. Now, a wired solution has a very single advantage, it's very reliable. So in very critical uh, automation type of processes, you will always remain wired, okay? Airplane industry probably will take a very, very long time until they're going to replace actually critical wires in the airplane by a wireless interface. Maybe it will never happen. Uh, a, a refinery plant in California, um, they will never ever for very critical processes actually have the cable replaced by a wireless because simply it is so much more reliable. On the other hand, it's very expensive to roll. It doesn't scale. There's no way we're going to connect 50 billion sensors with cables. So we know there will be a market share, which will be for wired solution, but the trend is here. Now, wireless capillary solution, capillary means really short range, Zigbee type, uh, Bluetooth type, etc. That was really hit for the past 10, 15 years. They haven't really solved the industrial problem, but what they have, have solved is it produced chips, which are really cheap. So you can buy Zigbee chips, which are very cheap today, Bluetooth in everybody's phone, very cheap, low power. It is truly low power, so it consumes very little power, it can live on a small battery for a long time. The disadvantage is short range. Short range is a very bad thing, actually, because it forces you, once you want to cover an, a larger area, it forces you to go multi-hop. Multi-hop is a bad thing. Academics love multi-hop because you can uh, publish a lot of stuff there, and, you know, degrees of freedom is infinite, so, <laughs> You can publish what you want because it's very difficult to compare A against B. Uh, from an industrial point of view, it, it really sucks. Okay, so I was CTO of my company, World Sensing. The first thing I did is I got rid of our multi-op solution and went to this solution. And I think it was the best move we could have done because we are very market competitive today. Okay, also to let you know that I was part of the team which decided in France Telecom to drop the 15.4 uh, standards development. 15.4 is the uh, constituent of Zigbee, okay? Because we realize it's not useful. It's not useful for very critical jobs. So the wireless cellular thing is, it's fantastic coverage. That's the advantage. No matter where you go, you have cellular coverage. Um, <coughs> on the downside, it's a bit expensive to actually operate. Uh, also, operators haven't really gone down the business models yet. So there's a lot of issues here, but just from a usability point of view, I think that's a beautiful solution. And we are currently living in a world where we are having a cellular M2M solution, but it's not the traditional operator one. I'm going to talk about this later on. So the novelty, if you look at this graph here, if you look at the 
average link ra uh, rate versus the distance, what we used to have before, long range, high rate, is all our 3GPP kind of uh, uh, environments. It's LT, LTA, 5G, everybody talking about. Now, short range, high rate is Wi Fi, and short range, low rate is Zigbee, and here was a gap. And this is the gap which M2M is taking care of right now. So we have a lot of users uh, communicating over a long distance using very little data per stream. An example is if you want to control your Coke machines in your city, okay, you just want to know whether the Coke machine is full or whether it's empty. It's a single bit you need to send from time to time. You may need to encrypt it so it's 16 bytes, but it's not a big deal compared to uh, high definition video streaming. On the other hand, there's so many more devices actually needing it. So there, these are the challenges we're trying to solve right now. Now what I'm going to do is I'm not going to dwell too much in, in, on the details, technical details. I just want to give you an overview about the short range technology, why I think they stand a little chance on the uh, long term horizon and which of them might stand a chance. You will, you will like it, uh, Judith, actually. And, uh, and then we go in the long range and then we go to the actual um, business cases. So Zigbee type of stuff, Bluetooth, you can buy it in abundance. There's so many solutions out there where you can actually go to a website, very cheap, very small, very power efficient, very well understood, a lot of open source. No problem. You can have your students program a smart home um, probably in a week's time. But there are challenges. Challenge number one is interference. It turns out that these, these solutions mainly use a 2.4 gig band. Now the 2.4 gig ISM band is just really interfere. Like it or don't like it, but uh, Wi-Fi is actually taking up a lot of um, power heads. It's a fight David against Goliath, okay? Because Zigbee is allowed to transmit at about 10 dBm and Wi-Fi has just so much more transmission power so whenever you switch on a Wi-Fi station, it just kills off completely uh, any of the Zigbee links. And this is what you observe. So in France Telecom, the reason why we dropped out of Zigbee in the end is, is because we build a beautiful mesh network in Alpe d'Huez, which is up in the Alps, up in the mountains. It just worked really well. And then we brought it down to the urban environment and it just stopped working completely because of interference. Okay? And because it's IEEE, there's no real interference mechanisms except from some NAV vectoring stuff, etc. And there's no interference uh, 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 me mechanism handling between systems, etc. So these systems have it very difficult to actually get data through in a reliable manner. You will get your bits and bytes through eventually, but if you have uh, control critical stuff to be transmitted, just forget about it. So a lot of companies moved to the sub gigahertz band. So there I showed two of them. Uh, they're more in the US 915, 433, 816, etc. Uh, 868, sorry. The problem is that the bandwidth, at least in Europe, is very narrow. It's uh, not a lot of channels there available, which means that once these M2M solutions start to scale up in the sub gigahertz band, there's actually going to be a lot of congestion, a lot of collusion. And this is what we observe with systems which use that band here to uh, today. So that's a challenge. I'm not saying it's not possible to do that, but it's a headache. Another challenge we had a while <coughs> back is a lack of standards. <coughs> so we had an internet which was really flat. Any computer could talk to any computer, whether there was an HP computer talking to a Mac computer, this was doable because we had designed a really flat and standardized internet. That was not the case for our sensor world. So there's world sensing, my company was not able to talk to uh, a crossbow sensor. There's no way of doing that, you always needed a propriety gateway which would translate the traffic into my propriety network. So we worked on that. Actually, uh, coincidentally, just to tell you, so this slide is now a few years old. This company has just been acquired by ARM. This is a European company by Zach. Uh, Dust has just been acquired by Linea. Coronis has been acquired by Elster. Crossbow has been acquired by, sorry, Archrock has been acquired by, uh, by Cisco. So you see that the, um, the smaller companies have proven that M2M can work and the bigger companies now biting in and I hope that uh, we do have a nice acquisition on the horizon as well so I hope this is going to work out uh, pretty well. Keep it low profile, okay? Um, so we worked like crazy to make it a standardized kind of solution so that means you know a crossbow sensor could talk to world sensing sensor etc. So IEEE kicked in and they worked a lot on the you know the physical and the Mac layer so the physical layer 
Well, you could argue as you want to argue. It was okay. It's actually six physical layers. In terms of Mac layer, the original Zigbee Mac layer was really bad. So what they came up with is a new one, 15.4e. It actually has three constituents, and one of them is a time frequency scheduled Mac, which is a be beautiful thing. And in, in, in fact, what you do is you tell everybody single, every sense in the system when to wake up exactly and at what frequency, okay? So they don't lose any time and energy to wake up, to listen. Is anybody communicating? Nobody communicating? Okay, I can transmit. Somebody communicating, I need to go back to sleep. So that wait, it's a lot of energy waste, particularly once the network scales up in size and in density. So synchronizing the whole network uh, turned out to be a really good choice. The reason we have not done this before is because for some reason, uh, we were under the impression that synchronizing networks is a very expensive thing to do in terms of energy. It turns out if you do the link by uh, the, the energy calculus, it's only about 0.01% of your whole energy budget which needs to be used for synchronization. So they solved that. That's a pretty neat Mac uh, and allows you essentially to build up quite a big uh, multi-hop network. Um, I inserted this box yesterday, actually, or two days ago. Um, let's go on here, I'll explain this in a moment. So we have the, the physical, the link layer, etc. established. Now we need to get the packets into the internet. So what the guy said is, okay, there's a problem here because the packets here are only about 127 bytes long and my IP packets are much longer. So they standardized the way how we chop actually big IP packets into smaller ones. How do we compress big IPv6 headers into small headers, which means that my IPv6 packet, which comes from the internet, can easily go through my embedded network. Okay, that's what they did, and in a standardized way. So meaning you don't have to buy a gateway which is specifically done for a specific solution. You can buy a Cisco router, a Cisco gateway, which works with a world sensing sensor or, or, or um, whatever other solution which is out there. <coughs> so they've done that. Then the routing, we worked a lot on routing, so I was involved quite a lot on this until I figured out it will never work. Uh, and then um, the routing was solved. It's a pretty good protocol, actually. The at transport layer, the state of the art was UDP, so there was, because simply we knew wireless, you know, very unreliable, TCP will screw it up. It turns out that we built such a stable kind of network from, you know, physical layer, medium access control, and the routing, that from, 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 uh, from the top, it looks like a cable almost. So people started using TCP again. Of course, a lightweight version, uh, so Adam Dunkels was a very big uh, proponent of this one. A lightweight TCP seems to work really well over embedded systems. And then we have the core, so RESTful interface. So we have a, you know, we can now talk to sensors the very same way we talk to websites. We just put in www.mishasensor.com slash temperature sensor. This is what we achieved to do, okay? Because of this stack we standardized here. And uh, it allows us essentially to have my little tiny sensor in Kaliningrad to talk to a superpower, supercomputer sensor in Australia. That, that's essentially the beauty of this whole uh, standardization exercise. And I've done, I think the community has done really, really well. Okay, then uh, having said this, because of the problems of multi-hop and my personal experience in France, again, with my own company with multi-hop, I don't think it stands in a long-term chance, to be honest, okay? To roll out big networks is very problematic. You can have multi-hop, two or three hops, that's all right. If you're gonna go 10 hops, even beyond 50 sensors, etc., it just turns out to be so unreliable. Packets get lost. And once packets get, get lost, they get lost for a very long time until you recuperate them. It's very problematic from an industrial point of view. You can't have it. So what I believe in when it comes to short range is Wi-Fi. Yes, Wi-Fi. So people, when they talk about Wi-Fi, they think about Wi-Fi being you know, a, a very high power solution um, consuming a lot of power, nobody ever thought of actually connecting a Wi-Fi radio to a sensor and uh, hoping, you know, the whole thing would be alive for 10 years. Now, it turns out that if you tune a little bit the stack of Wi-Fi, you can do it. And you can do it even within the framework of the standard today. And we have a beautiful standard available today. And the advantage is really, you have a ubiquitous infrastructure. So Wi-Fi is everywhere, no matter where I am on the planet, I'm, I'm finding some Wi-Fi stations. 
So we don't need to tell people, hey, buy a Zigbee dongle, buy a USB, or you buy another dongle, buy another dongle. If Wi-Fi is there, you can use it. Very vibrant standard. People are really into it, standardizing. Interference management, to a certain extent, uh, is there within the actual Wi-Fi system and the sound security is in place. So it has all the ingredients to be a system which will scale very, very quickly. And that's the reason why actually companies like uh, Qualcomm um, and other giants are actually building you know, chips today which support essentially Zigbee and low power Wi-Fi already together. Okay, so, and you will see essentially temperature sensors, light bulbs, um, whatever you want to measure to be connected to a low power Wi-Fi network. So, and that gives a lot of scalability to the whole system because you don't have to worry about coverage anymore. But here comes a real bomb. It turns out if you look at the energy consumed by, <laughs> by sending a little bit of data, like a kilobyte of data, log file, or some temperature, longer temperature measures, and you compare that using Zigbee, the standardized Zigbee versus the low power Wi-Fi, you do the maths, it turns out that low power Wi-Fi uses about 10 times less energy than Zigbee does. So there was a community here for 15 years trying to come up with the most power efficient or energy efficient system on the, on the planet and they're still about 10 times more, uh, consuming 10 times more energy than low power Wi-Fi. That's very interesting. So the reason is because low power Wi-Fi is very, very good in sending uh, small, medium sized data packets very quickly over the interface so they can switch off the radio very quickly, which is what consumes most of the power. Uh, and of the energy. So it turns out that low power Wi-Fi is really a good choice and a very, very good uh, competition for the Z uh, Zigbee type of technology. Now let's move on to cellular end-to-end to -end technology. Um, cellular is beautiful because it really provides ubiquitous coverage as well. So no matter where I am, I have coverage, which is very good for me as from a company point of view. If I want to sell my solution somewhere in the world, the last thing I want to worry about is to send my engineers there starting to install, you know, base stations, gateways, repeaters, etc. Every environment is different. There's a lot of headaches involved, a lot of money involved. So if coverage is already there because somebody has done it, the operators have done it, it's their job. They've done it for the past 30 years. They know how to do it. Coverage is there. I can use my sensors, plug and play, switch it on. We'll connect to the cellular base station and we'll work. It allows me to do something which neither Wi-Fi nor Zigbee can do. I can roam, I can have mobility, there's handover. We are really good in that. Our community, the cellular community, has been doing nothing else the past decades than to design handover procedures, uh, roaming procedures, etc. That means if I install a mobile solution on a truck, which is measuring something on a train, on a car, and it travels through Spain, through England, goes to France, it will work. It will work on the road. It will work changing countries. Interference, we dominate this really well. So that's something we can do. We have worked on interference control mechanism. Uh, putting in another 50 billion devices, I think, should work. And we have service platforms, something you know people uh, tend to underestimate. What we have out there is very big uh, service providers which have a platform offering a lot of different services. Now adding another end-to-end -end service um, I can hear is very simple to do. Whereas the Wi-Fi community, the Zigbee community, has to build this from scratch, which is always difficult to reach critical mass. This is their worldwide uh, proven. So therefore, I give the cellular community a very big plus when it comes to long-term survivability of connecting my machines. But there are problems. The problem is because we designed cellular to be very different from what we would like to use it. Now, cellular has been designed for a few users comparably. Main traffic is download. We tolerate jitter. We, we recharge our mobile phones, and if somebody steals my phone, I'm gonna go to the shop and complain. Machines are exactly the opposite. There's so many more machines. There's mainly downlink, uh, sorry, mainly uplink. There's a lot of uplink data going, okay? It's very short packets. It has to, a lot of this has to be time critical. Nobody's going to recharge my sensors. They have to live for a very long time, either autonomously um, or they have to have a really power efficient uh, radio. 
And of course, security has to be automated. Trust mechanisms have to be placed uh, in, in, in place, etc. So there's a lot of challenges here because the system is in fact exactly the inverse of how we had it over these past years. So no surprise that standards bodies like Etsy, 3GPP and IEEE is ramping up its activities and starting to become really, really active in trying to make sense out of this. So I've been involved in Etsy end to end. It's a very active group in actually designing the standards landscape of, uh, of machine to machine. 3GPP is waking up, IEEE is waking up. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about these two. Now Etsy started a long time ago and they said, hey, let's divide the end to end sphere into you know, the device domain, the network domain, the application domain. So the device domain is where the sensors are, uh, where the meters are, the actuators, etc. Network domain is where the stuff flows through and application domain is where you actually use it. Now if you look at the, you know, the interfaces which are being used, you see in the device domain, you know, you see things we have seen for the last five years, nothing new. So we're not trying to invent a new thing, we're just trying to tune it actually. So we use power line communication, Zigbee, whatever you want to use, so they, they were pretty open to that. On the access network part, um, you have uh, you know, different types of access here, wireless LAN, WiMAX, free GPP, et cetera. Uh, core network, you have the uh, NGN, Etsy, TIE span. And then on the application, you have the different applications here. So my company is in here. Uh, that's a good space to be in. That's a good space to be in. Uh, just for you to know, if you ever think of actually starting your own company. So in this space here, you make about $1 revenue. Uh, here you make about $10 revenue. And here you make about you know, hundred dollars revenue. So if you want to be somewhere, uh, you'd better be here. When we started um, about five years ago, this was not there. So we did actually everything end to end. We understand it very well. But if I had to start my company again, I would just start here. Just use what's out there and just build on the services and the, and the applications. Okay, going from Etsy to 3GPP, 3GPP has been very silent on end to end for a very long time. The, the reason is because, first of all, UMTS um, is not useful at all for supporting billions of devices. It's a pretty lousy system. Those who deal with it, they know about it. Um, you know, anything you look at, the limited amount of codes, the, the problem with the power control, et cetera, et cetera. So UMTS is a big problem. So 3 gpu has been very reluctant on going on there. LT changed the game. LT and LTA, are very suitable for sensors because you can, uh, those who know how LT and LT uh, at, at physical layer works, you have O of DMA, so you can choose a certain set of sub carriers. The minimum you can choose is 12 today. There's no reason why you should use uh, less in the future, but right now it's 12. Um, you can use one or two of the M symbol. So there's a bit of data you're transmitting here, and, <coughs> and it's quite, uh, quite a useful system. The only downside I'm telling you right now is are the patent costs. So it turns out, that the patent cost on the LT modem is 42 euros. That's a lot of money, okay? So it will take a long time until we come to the point that way I can send, sell you know, my, my M2M radio for $1 because of the patent cost is $42. So it's a chicken egg situation right now. But we're getting there, so people know about this. What 3GPP said is that the applications are so diverse that doing a single specification doesn't make sense. They said the future will be you go in an M2M shop and it will have a feature list. And you will go with your, with your clerk through the feature list. What do you want? Okay, you have a hospital. You want to instrument your hospital, the machines, the patients, the doors, the heating, ventilation, etc., etc. So what do you figure out? You tick off what you need and you, you delete what you don't need. So low mobility, time control, time tolerance, small, small data, mobile originated only. So let me give you an example why this is important. Low mobility, okay, that's true. So probably in your hospital, you're very kind of limited in your mobility. Low mobility means no handovers, okay, you're just there. No handovers means you can cut out a lot of handover control traffic from your actual uh, cellular system, which means you can save a lot of energy, okay? Just getting rid uh, of this type of traffic uh, <laughs> saves you a lot of energy and is very good for your machine to machine traffic. So if you're low mobility, that would not even engage in handover traffic. You actually help the network and you help the nodes. Another one maybe 
mobile originated only. Mobile originated only means that it is the machine which you put somewhere will notify you there's a problem. You're not able to reach it. Okay, so if you have a sensor on the door, which is actually programmed to be an alarm, you and you tick this one off, mobile origin only, it's only the sensor which says, hey, the door's open. You will not be able to ping the sensor and say, hey, sensor, are you still alive? Are you still good? Is the door closed or open? You can't do it. Now, the advantage of doing this is you can cut out um, a lot of paging traffic, okay? So the paging traffic, the traffic where actually a base station is trying to see whether a node is still alive um, can just be cut out of the network, which saves you again a lot of bandwidth um, and a lot of uh, actual energy on the mobile terminal. So you go through all that and you optimize your system, okay? And then you, the operator would tune the, the actual network and you would have your system up and running, okay? So this is what 3GBP is doing. So they're working on this TS-22 368 and currently they are standardizing also some protocols. It's moving very quickly these days. Now I've been working with some colleagues on an architecture here, just as an example. It's an LTA architecture where we have humans and machines coexist. So we have HTC, which is a human type traffic, okay? And we have MTC, which is a machine type traffic, uh, machine type communication as FreeTVP calls it. So we came up with a pretty neat uh, architecture here, which allows both systems to coexist in a, in a very peaceful manner using either direct communication, direct through an M2M -M gateway here, or you know, a, a type, of, type of device to device communication. We came up with some radio resource management algorithms here. So we worked really on that. I don't want to go into detail. The only, one, uh, only thing I want to show you are simulation results. So what we did is we simulated two um, methods here. One method is we always give the humans priority. So if a human wants to make a phone call, he would get priority. And the other method is we give uh, priority always to the machines. So when the machine wants to communicate something, it would always get priority in the system. And then we looked at the typical um, parameters we have here. I don't want to go through details. I just want to show you the actual graph. And this graph has some historic background, which I'm going to explain in a moment. But let's go through the, uh, through the actual results. So what we plot here is the, tr the dropping probability versus the numbers of machine in the cell associated to a single base station, okay? Dropping probability is something which the operator is very keen on seeing because if you drop a lot of users, the user experience goes down. So if you're talking and suddenly a call is being dropped, you don't like that. It happens 10 times and you change operator, okay? It leads to customer churn. So the customer churn is directly linked to the dropping probability. So it's an interesting metric for the, for the operator. And here we ramp this up, the numbers of machines. So we have four graphs, naturally, for the dropping probability of four humans, dropping probability of four machines with the two different methods. As you can see, if we give priority always to the humans, okay, the dropping probability of the humans barely changes, even though I'm starting to have more and more machines in the network, which is good news. That means, you know, once you start ramping up more and more sensors in your city, you can be sure that your actual you know, voice and data services will not be geopathized. On the other hand, if you use the other methods, it's pretty lousy. Well, I just wanted to tell you that you know, we showed this is doable. And the reason was because in 2009, late 2008, I was trying to convince the operators in Spain to give me a good deal on uh, M2M. I told them, look guys, I'm gonna roll out a network of uh, probably 10,000 M2M nodes, and uh, I would like you to give me a good data plan. And they were refusing on the simple ground. They're saying, once we start putting in 10,000 nodes in the system, it would screw up my human type of traffic, okay? So I went back to my students and we started actually working on trying to figure out, you know, whether this is true or not. And it turns out if you do it in a clever way, it doesn't have to happen. If you do it in a stupid way, it will happen. So therefore there's a lot of room here. So if you guys work on radio resource management, you know, to find a good solution which is balancing the time criticality of the M2M -M traffic versus the, the need of having a very low dropping probability of uh, human type of traffic, a lot of room. We've done two very si si simple methods, but you can improve on that. Okay, let's go to the business and market. So 
when it comes to the applications, what is driving the deployment of end-to-end uh, -end is clearly <coughs> sorry, the return of investment, so the ROI. Okay? So the first thing which really comes out as very useful is the real-time instrumentation, the ability to have real-time data coming to your decision-making processes is just giving you so much extra value. You can avoid accidents, uh, you can optimize your processes, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of stuff you can do. And again, in General Electric, have worked very meticulously on these numbers to figure out how much that is. Another advantage is the actual big data value. As you start mixing data from different domains, um, I'm saying here you know, purposely cross-domain data, your actual value goes up. Okay, coming back to the example of my traffic jams in Barcelona with the football game, just having the parking data is not very useful. Just having the traffic flow data is not very useful. Just having the weather information or just the, uh, the football information is not very useful. But once you put it all together, this is where the value comes. Big data here does not necessarily mean it has to be voluminous. It doesn't need to be very big. Big can be a, a single bit can contribute here. You know, a bit saying there's a Barcelona Madrid game, yes or no. And it changes the whole story. So therefore, you need to understand that the value is in the heterogeneity of useful data. And there's a lot of stuff I think you can research on, and I think you guys are pretty good at that. Another one, return of investment, is simply you save on, on wireless. Okay, going wireless gives you a lot of competitive advantage. As we see cost versus time, and you look at the computing ingredients, how much they cost. The sensor ingredients, how much they cost. It all goes down over time. Silicon gets cheaper. Now, what gets more expensive over time is installation costs. Human labor is more expensive. People steal cables, etc. It's just going up the cost. Now, once you go wireless, suddenly you save 90% of the cost. And I'll show you a real world example on that later on. So there's an enormous kind of return of investment saving just from going wired to wireless. So there's no surprise that a lot of markets are waking up now. So smart grid market, home automation, uh, industrial automation, smart cities, etc. Telemetry has been traditionally the market which has been uh, well equipped with M2M solution. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the smart city market, which I'm very familiar with. And uh, what we have today is, is uh, with my company incidentally, but there are loads of them, so we're not the only one, a smart city control platform. So what you have is you take a lot of data streams from different sensors in the field, put all together, visualize it, analyze it, profile it, predict, etc., etc. So my company does parking. So what we do is we put actually sensors in each parking spot and we measure the availability of the parking spots in real time in a very robust manner. Um, we have, I have another company which is called SenseField, which measures the traffic flow. We cooperate with a company called BitCarrier, which is able to measure the travel time we have, uh, we collaborate with a company called Smart Bins, which measures how full your uh, rubbish bins are actually. We measure critical infrastructure. So you put it all together, you can just suddenly you can start really interesting things. Um, here we can, for instance, find people who haven't paid their parking ticket. Um, here we can, here and here, we can tell people how best to find a parking spot. Or we can tell a company to come and pick up the rubbish bin, but don't use that road because it's blocked use that road. So once you put all this information together, suddenly you have a lot of potential of doing things here. So we won the Moscow tender, so we are instrumenting right now Moscow with all the parking spots. So if you get in Moscow a parking fine, this is probably because of us. So I'm sorry for that <laughs> beforehand. So Moscow has a very big traffic problem, particularly in downtown because a lot of roads are actually one, one way. People looking for parking blocking the, the roads. So the ability to say there's a parking space free or not free would deter people to go in and therefore block the traffic. And they have seen an improvement about 20% today and we hope to bring it up to 30% of traffic improvements downtown, which is notable in a city. Another one we did is we instrumented the, uh, the harbor of Barcelona. So they're building the biggest uh, passenger par harbor in the world actually in Barcelona. <coughs> and they needed 200 uh, sensors here which would have been 72 kilometers of cable, all right? So the company who came to install it prepared for one week installation. In a few hours, they were done, okay? Just plug and play. Just put the sensors, 
and they went up and running. Now those who are into wireless, they know it's not so simple. Yeah, a lot of things can go wrong, but we worked of course on that and we managed to solve it. But just this, saving the, the cable cost, saving the installation cost brought down the CapEx cost significantly and saves them right now the, the capital expenditure as well. Okay? So we get real-time information now what's happening in the port. They need it because very close to the shore, they want to make sure that nothing actually falls. We have also instrumented the Palau San Jordi, which is a bit like the uh, Bolshoi in, 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 in Moscow. So we know exactly which part of the, uh, of the structure is being overloaded, which part is in troubles, etc. So very good for historical sites. So just the last one here, so some examples, some other smart city examples. So that's uh, another uh, rubbish bin company which has sensors inside. That's our direct competitor in the United States, Streetline Networks. Um, they're doing essentially the same. We had this, the same idea at the same time in 2008. So we started to develop independently and now we're kind of uh, frenemies. We, we know them really well, but we're competing on the markets actually. We have uh, pollution warning sensors. We have sensors which can measure electricity and electricity leak in the city. You will not believe how much electricity is lost actually in the town halls because just nobody cares about this. You care because you pay the bill, but then nobody cares, okay? So there's a lot of stuff coming out here. Street lightning um, is very popular. In fact, if you look at, your, at these applications, it's only this one, this one, and that one, which gives the city a meaningful return of investment. So here they can save about 30% electricity lighting, which is a lot. In Barcelona, it's 2 million euros every year if they install the smart street lighting. Here they're able to optimize the parking uh, um, uh, 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 procedures. So we're able to say who paid the ticket, who didn't pay the ticket. So that gives an extra revenue of about 30% up, which is also a few million a year. <coughs> and that one is just also optimizing the, uh, the urban rubbish collection uh, procedures. So it turns out that this one, this one, this one, and in the southern country, uh, solutions related to water. So when do you actually water your cities, uh, your parks, etc.? These are very, very useful. That is only taken off now, so we need to see how the return of investment models will play out. Okay, let me conclude. Instead of doing traditional conclusions, I want to conclude with some predictions, okay? So my first prediction is that the Zigbee type of solutions, 815.4 uh, uh, type of solutions will be dead very soon. They will never ever reach critical mass. Now when I say critical mass, I mean a notable percentage of M2M traffic on the planet, okay? You will always find projects which have a few thousands uh, M2M Zigbee sensors, you will always find them. But compared to 50 billion, that is very, very small. And simply the reason is that the technology is just not delivering what we need. It's just not useful um, for most of the applications which are very interesting um, again uh, these days. Low power Wi-Fi has a good chance. We'll see whether that will happen. But because we have an excellent coverage globally in terms of Wi-Fi and no need to buy an extra dongle to make your home network or whatever, or your, your factory network. Wi-Fi is just really useful in, in providing that. <coughs> Another type of system which is really taken off now, I haven't talked about this, is cellular, but propriety, okay? For the time being. So we are talking not about the cellular 3GPP type of family. We're talking about systems like Newell, uh, Sigfox, uh, Ciclio, probably you've never heard of these companies. What they do is they provide radios which communicate at a very, very narrow band. Because you need to transmit just a byte, a bit, 16 bytes, 100 bytes, very little data. So that requires very low data rates. Very low data rates require very, very narrow bandwidth. So narrow, very narrow bandwidth even with 10 dBm transmission power, which is the limit by regulation, uh, allows you to have link budgets which are just similar to satellite budgets. That's a big surprise. Because of the narrow bandwidth, you don't capture all the noise. You capture very little noise. You have link budgets of 150, 160 dB. That's as if I want to communicate from my mobile phone to a satellite out there. And these systems are out there, so Moscow is using one of them. So we installed that. The beautiful thing is, instead of installing 50 gateways, 
uh, and 200 repeaters, we put a single gate base station, which is an ultra narrow band end to end base station, which covers all our sensors in the city, all of them, okay, with a single base station. So that really scales and it really works well. And the technology works so well that when my CEO was flying from Barcelona to Paris, whilst he was landing in Paris, the sensor was still seeing the base station in Barcelona, okay? So it's a very powerful technology. The only problem is it's proprietary. But people are starting now working on standards, the 154K standard coming out. So I think there is something happening uh, these years, months, which might give a lot of hope to a uh, type of cellular solutions, but much cheaper than my traditional, let's say, orange operator, BT, uh, megaphone or whatever okay so we are having a new ecosystem emerging we'll see how this plays out probably with acquisitions probably Vodafone will buy you know uh, Sigfox or one of these companies at some point because it's a good technology it's very useful <coughs> my prediction number two is that with the with some exceptions the operators will miss out again on the opportunity to become a true service provider okay they have done this really well before they screwed it up before, so they have looked just at the data pipes and uh, were really surprised when suddenly they run out of the uh, margins, the profit margins, okay? Because just providing pipes is a commodity job and naturally will not give you healthy, healthy margins, which has made it worse due to the regulations in Europe and worldwide, etc. So again, M2M is the opportunity for operators to hey, not only provide the data pipe, meaning not only make sure that my bit from my sensor goes to my uh, gateway, but also capitalize on the data which flows through. Capitalize on the data. So when I talked to the operators two, three years ago, or four years ago on the, on the data plan for my sensors, I, they asked me for one euro 50 per sensor per month. That's too much. I cannot build a 10,000 node network and pay you know, uh, uh, 15,000 euros per month. I, it just doesn't scale. I told them, guys, give it to me for free and I'll give you the data. Work on the data, collect the data, get everybody's data and capitalize on the big data value. There was no way. So therefore, you know, their way of thinking, uh, the, the, how the business models are built, etc., are data pipe models. So therefore, they will miss out again and we will have a new kind of uh, league of M2M service providers. It's actually those who will really make uh, sense out of this are those who integrate the data, but not only an integrator like us, but an integrator of an integrator. So uh, companies like IBM, Oracle, Capita, so companies maybe you've never heard of, they gather a lot of data, a lot of intelligence, put it together, make sense out of this, and sell this intelligence. Now these are big guys. It's a very expensive circle to be in. Their business is somewhere else. IBM's business is somewhere else than in M2M data analytics, okay? Before the CEO of IBM says, hey, yeah, you know what? M2M is a good business. Let me put a lot of guys into this area and beef up the technology service provisioning in M2M. It will take a long time. Therefore, companies like mine have it very difficult and it will take a much longer time for M2M to really take off despite the obvious that it's very useful. Nobody doubts that having real-time data from whatever you need the real-time data, be it the parking, be it the traffic pollution, street light, whatever, is very useful. It's very useful stuff. But to build a business model out of this, which really makes sense to those companies who will explore it, will take a long time. Now, a young company like my company <coughs> is uh, having a lot of troubles with that because it means long sales cycles, okay? So between a first contact with a customer and the final sales, if you strike lucky, two years, okay? And when you strike lucky, you get a very big project. So first you suffer of actually surviving a very long sales cycle without actually getting any single pound and still paying 35 people to do the job. And then suddenly you get a you know, very, very big project and you have to fulfill it and you have very few people to do the job. So it's a kill and kill situation. It's very difficult. It's a very difficult space to be in, but it's very rewarding. And I'm very lucky that with World Sensing, we've done uh, pretty well 
uh, despite the very heavy industrial senses of uh, verticals of oil and gas, construction and, and transportation. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Questions? Yes, Adam. So, thank you. Very interesting story. A lot of experience. Great stuff. Well, uh, let me uh, ask about two aspects related <coughs> to the very basic radios mm -hmm. in what you said. So, you uh, probably are coming from uh, two very uh, lucky countries. Uh, Spain and UK, mm -hmm. where you have this beautiful cellular coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, if you try to travel from Berlin to Dresden or Berlin to Hanover, okay, you will have one radio hole after the other. Mm -hmm. So I'm not so convinced about this global coverage of the cellular mm -hmm. networks on this side, specifically if we go into the building. So if you could comment on that out of your experience, uh, because I would tend rather to think about, indeed, like you mentioned, the combination of, of say, uh, low power Wi-Fi with the cellular. With the long cellular, I'm a little bit uh, skeptical about the coverage. Mm -hmm. so that's number one. Number two, it's this uh, narrow band uh, appearing. Mm -hmm. uh, that is really something beautiful. Now, that has one issue which is inherent to the narrow band, vulnerability to bad guys, mm -hmm. interference mm -hmm. and such. So, uh, how are the uh, companies developing that, trying to uh, assure at least a minimum, say, reliability, specifically in the CP infrastructure, specifically if we might have even a terroristic, you know, type of of really very bad guys yeah. trying to hit it and corrupt it. Okay, yeah, question number one. So, coverage in the UK is actually not that good. <coughs> coverage in Spain is very good. Uh, here in Russia is very good and China is very good. I didn't know Germany is so bad, but UK is very, mixed, mixed. UK is very bad too. Um, remember that for the uh, low data rate traffic, yeah. you are, you're getting away with a fairly large link budget. So on the, uh, you know, on the modulation and coding uh, control stuff, you're really at the very low indices. So what you need to do a voice call and a data call is a different story to what you need to do your control channel call, okay? And this is mostly what you need for doing the, uh, uh, the data transmission of a few bytes and bits. In fact, Ericsson proposed now a way of using the, uh, the RUC, the random access channel, to transmit already the end-to-end -end traffic. So you don't need to ping, establish channel, establish barrier, transmit the data, just do it in a, like the SMS, like a backhaul, okay? Now, I believe that the operator signed a contract of covering the countries with 99%, they have it with the government, okay? Now population. I huh? Population. Of the population. No, I think it's ge geography. It's geography. Yeah, I think it's geography, and they're tricking, of course, because they're working with the control channels. Okay, yeah. but which is good enough for my end-to-end -end traffic. But you're right, it might, be, it might be a problem, but the general trend is that you need to measure, you need to measure where also the people are, yeah. and where the people are is typically where you also have the coverage, okay? So I, I have never heard anybody complaining so far about an end-to-end -end coverage hole, which was kind of serious, okay? So that's, that's the story. In home, it's very interesting and I think there's a lot of potential here. And one thing I will be looking now starting at King's is something to make some uh, two paradigms. One is femtocell and the other is M2M. Uh, it's very interesting because both are kind of deregulated from an operator's point of view, okay? So there are a lot of degrees of freedom which give a lot of uncertainty. On the other hand, we understand the potential because femtocells gives a good range in the home and you can connect anything you want. So I think there's a lot of open stuff to be done. So I'm not saying this is solved. So I think that's an interesting area actually to go down the road with, yeah. On the second question, the narrow band. Now it turns out that interference is actually a, a playing to the advantage of the narrow band in this scenario. Unless of course you get really bad guys which purposely screw the band above 
there's certain yeah. yeah but you can have these also on the gsm band you can have them also on the UPS band and they are wide band jammers of two megahertz available which can just or 20 megahertz you can just screw it out okay compared to um now if you if i can i can i withdraw yeah, that sure, here sure. yeah so if you look at the uh so our solution was chosen in the end in Moscow because it was very resilient to interference, which was in general around, okay? So we have our gateway really up on the roof, okay? Very high. What the other guys, guys have, uh, the, the Zigbee guys, they have the gateways down here, okay? Now, down here, you would typically have interferer, okay? Now, you have a, a wide band here. This is your uh, transmission power, okay? So my Zigbee uses this type of power and I'm using this type of power, which from a link budget point of view gives me this one here for uh, Zigbee and this one here for my uh, narrowband system simply because I'm capturing less noise, okay? Even though I have the same transmission power, that's the beauty of it. Now, it turns out that, yeah, you can easily screw this vent, but you have to be very close to the base station. Mm -hmm. So in the uplink, even though there are a lot of 10, D, uh, 10 dBm uh, transmission guys down here radiating, their radiation is always down in the street. It might be just here under the rooftop. But you need to actually interfere my antenna to screw out my signal here. So I'm really elevated. So in the uplink, I'm really protected. Downlink is a completely different story, okay? So these link budgets will never hold in the downlink. This is a pure M2M uplink solution. You can reach from time to time the downlink, I have no doubt, but it's much more susceptible to interference. Yeah, you're right. So, yeah, that's a story. There's no single-sided metal. But um, in terms of the general interference which is around, I'm not talking about bad guys doing purposely, it's very difficult to screw up the uplink for these machines, which makes it a beautiful solution in a sense. Yeah? Okay. Any more questions? Giuseppe. Oh, uh, first of all, thanks for the presentation. Very, very exciting, uh, very broad. Uh, also, the business parts uh, were very enlightening. Actually, I want to go back to a very academic question. So, very basic for the people also in the room. Uh, my feeling is that machine to machine communication may change the type of uh, hardware processes that they mostly play. That is, uh, instead of usual post on arrivals and so on, there will be substantial correlation. So my first question is, <coughs> the second, in parallel to that, the part of the system that will be much more stressful will be the random access uh, channel. Yeah. Because actually that will, because of course, you yes. need very little yes. data, but you need to access yes. it. And so basically, do you know about works that are trying yes. to understand yes. uh, the issue? And also in your results, did you consider uh, arrivals uh, yes. that are concentrated or whatever? Yeah. Okay, so the first question on arrivals, so they are essentially from an, just from an industrial perspective, there are three types of traffics uh, emerging. One is a very regular one, okay? So it might be every five minutes, every hour, every half a day, every week. You get a, a bit of by the stream of data saying, I'm okay, this is the status, etc. Okay, so that's one traffic class, which is not giving a lot of troubles, okay? Because you know when it happens, it doesn't happen too often, uh, it's very deterministic. Yeah, Yeah, so I'm coming to the second and third. So yeah, so the second one is a pure random, still Poisson, okay? So still Poisson with the slightly different distributions as we have for whatever, voice, uh, voice arrival rates, etc. But it's still Poisson type of traffic. This is like measuring random events or, you know, a threshold eventing typically. Now the correlated stuff is alarms, okay? So you can have that. So you have, a, let's say, a factory equipped with uh, uh, gas sensors, whatever. Maybe you have it also at home when you cook and you have more than one sensor at home, they will go off at more or less at the same time. So this happens in my home, even though I don't cook very often, but it happens. And when I, hap when I cook, it happens precisely. So I'm burning the food. Because it's, it's, uh, um, now it turns out when, when these alarms go off, uh, people have concentrated, or academics have concentrated a lot in trying to get all the messages through. In fact, you just need to get the first message through. Okay, it's just one message which counts on this correlated set, which says there's a problem. 
the rest you sort out uh, you know later so I think you need to work more along this line I agree the current systems are not actually designed to do it because they will try to get all the messages through okay so if you kind of could establish um, and this is what's happening in 3GPP so-called uh, message classes um, a part that you have priority alarms you have group based features okay and that has been recognized as a very important issue also for addressing because in fact for your alarm sensors you don't need necessarily to address every single sensor se uh, separately they could have all the same IP address okay it's just matters to say there's a problem that's it so therefore you know people are working on this but I'm not saying it's kind of solved in terms of random access it's a big problem it's a very big problem once you start you know ramping up scaling up the machines etc so that's why people are trying to look in these Trojan horses type of approaches which I mentioned like Edison uh, together with KTH proposed a solution of putting essentially the data traffic already in the association procedures okay so you, you save a lot of uh, uh, bandwidth, etc. I don't think you can do it much better unless you schedule it. And I think this can happen as well. So you have very time controlled data. So that means you know that at noon, my sensor wakes up, gets time slot X, frequency Y, and transmits the data, okay? You will always need some random access procedures. I mean, you perfectly know about it. So the best you can do is to put the data traffic within the random access procedures. And because they can't hear each other, you just have to go through the normal rock type of procedures unless you wake up from time to time and get some broadcast information i'm sure you can find trade-offs for different <coughs> traffic types but we are in infancy so this end to end stuff is really kind of at the same inflection point as the computing industry was like 30 years ago and the telecom industry was 15 years ago so i think that's a it's a really new thing which is emerging here and i do encourage you to work on all the problems which, which we have, which really are there. So it's not only academic problems, also very industrial problems. Yeah. Yes? A uh, very quick question. I will uh, lend something from uh, the presentation also of the former keynote speaker, mm -hmm. speaker yesterday. And uh, there was a <coughs> that I looked at yesterday, and uh, it is something that is uh, very, very easy multiplication between. Uh, the distance, the coverage, the, the frequency, and uh, the time mm -hmm. in using uh, some resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your vision, the time and the frequency is, uh, band is very, very small, but the coverage, the area is so huge because you say that you want to have like a cellular, but not uh, as cellular is going to it become, is going in the direction cellular networks are going. I think uh, about mm -hmm. uh, Femtocells or, or mm. something like that. Mm. You said something very, very centralized, very uh, huge coverage. How uh, you think to obtain uh, such kind of uh, uh, coverage uh, without the waste that uh, it happens? Uh, like you said, also said with a billion of sensors. How? Uh, why do you want to to waste all this coverage for that single sensor instead of having? Uh, a dense network, a smaller uh, coverage, uh, why do you prefer uh, having this vision? And uh, the second part of the, the question is, uh, do you think that uh, uh, mobile operators, cellular mo operators uh, will maintain such kind of revenues uh, uh, saying, okay, the prices will be very low for you because uh, you have just to send uh, very few bits uh, or will uh, have uh, different prices for machines and for human communication? Mm. Yeah, so on the, on the first question, in fact, I did not uh, propone, I did not, you know, kind of say that we should have one cell per country and that would kind of cover the whole thing. The, my message was get rid of multi-hop. So as long as you get rid of multi-hop, you're fine. Star networking, I think, is the right way to go in industrial settings. Even as an academic, you may not like it, okay, because it's easy. Maybe it's easy, not easy, I don't know. But there are a lot of challenges still. I, I, you know, you can believe me in that. But uh, um, I'm just saying that, get rid of the multi-hop gives a lot of problems, really a lot of problems. So if, like Adam says, you know, in the building, these base station narrowband, very poor coverage down in the basement, it's very bad, okay? So also for our parking sensors, which are below a car, so it's a metal reflecting shield, just 20 centimeters above it, 
it's uh, 60 dB loss, 60 dB, okay? It's just a bit which comes out on the sides. So coverage is not easy, it's very, very tricky. Um, just, you know, you will have just fewer base stations and fewer repeaters, less street furniture, uh, less new silicon and batteries to be rolled out. That's all I'm saying, and you can have it today, there's no need to have multi-off, okay? What's the trend right now? I think these proprietary solution will be a midterm solution. Sigfox has raised 10 million dollars, 10 million euros uh, last year. They want to raise 100 million euros this year or next year to be a global end-to-end -end, uh, uh, operator. And I agree with you, I think it will not work out because they will cover the whole globe without having actually in probably 99% of the planet uh, a single sensor connected. Okay, it doesn't make sense. From a business point of view, it doesn't make sense. So we'll see how this plays out, but I think they're driving towards an acquisition by a big operator, maybe a Verizon, Vodafone, whatever, you know. So we'll, we'll see how this plays out. But yeah, get rid of multi hop make the size you want to have it, but just try to have a single op. And I think Femto, Femto and M2M indoors, yeah, I think is a very nice solution. And it's going with a trend of current, you know, cellular type of rollouts. And LTE or any evolution of that, LTA and maybe even the 5G system, lend itself very neatly to having end-to-end -to -end traffic supported because you are able to have just as, as little, you know, one single, um, single sub-carrier might be just the very narrow bandwidth, okay? So you could emulate in large parts the benefits of my ultra-narrow band systems, proprietary systems with a standardized LT system. And I think this is what we need to do in the 5G design. We'll see, yeah? Any more questions? Thank you, Misha. Okay, thank you. For the next talk, we have some time, and your taxi with the blonde driver is already. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> the blonde driver. <laughs> <laughs>